Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to this British Malaysian uh, Society uh, webinar. Uh, people are now uh, checking in, as it were, joining us. Uh, the numbers are, are coming up. Um, it's 10.59 here in, in London. Our formal start uh, is 11 uh, o'clock. Uh, my name's David Stringer uh, Lamar a member of the executive committee of the British Malaysian Society and also a part-time model because this is the new British uh, Malaysian Society tie now available in limited quantities. Get them while they're still available. There we are, that's my part-time bit. And obviously I get a commission for every tie sold. That bit is a joke and the treasurer's just had a, a heart attack. Um, so we've got a great lineup today of our experts looking at uh, the, the property scene and obviously the opportunities and challenges uh, that lie uh, within, within that. So the numbers are nicely building here, and I would now like uh, to invite, in fact, just before I do that, I will say that the tech team today, uh, those people uh, hopefully working, Vanessa Del Bosco, and also uh, Rev Roberts uh, and myself. So Vanessa, if I hand over to you, please, give us some rules. Thank you, David. Good morning and welcome, everybody. Please let us know where you're dialing in from today by typing in the chat box. There are three ways you can engage today. Many of you have already discovered the chat function. I recommend you change the audience to say all panelists and attendees so you can interact with each other too. If you have a question for the panel, please put it in the Q&A box. We recommend you use the Q&A function because we'll not be checking the chat for questions. So questions in the Q&A and you should be able to like the questions that are your favorites. That makes sure we answer the questions that you want answered. Questions in the Q&A, go in there and like your favorites. Final way to engage today, please watch the chat and please post what you do and your LinkedIn profile link in the chat. At the end of the webinar, go to the three little dots and save the chat to connect with other attendees on LinkedIn. Questions in the Q&A, interact in the chat, LinkedIn profile in the chat. This session's being recorded. Back to you, David. Great, terrific. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Vanessa. And obviously we're, we're all about connectivity as well. So do put your details there in the chat and let's make uh, some things uh, happen. Now, in terms of the format uh, of the event, we have our five experts who are gonna share uh, their expertise with us uh, during this webinar. And after that, uh, we have the, the questions and answer sessions. And as Vanessa's mentioned, um, they're voted for in the Q&A. So, so get in there and then we'll, we'll start uh, grilling our experts with those at the end of, of the session. Um, let's get moving down the order. So it's now my uh, great pleasure uh, to invite our illustrious uh, chairman, Mason Lai, OBE DL. Chairman, over to you. I'm so excited I may actually eat our lunch today, which will be meatloaf. Ah, uh, that is not supposed to happen, not a problem at all. Uh, Mason Lai, over to you. If you could unmute, unmute. I've just done well. that. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to our property investment in the UK and Malaysia webinar. Delighted to have a hundred attendees to hear from our panel of experts. I can think of no better property expert than that of Siri Michael Yam to give us an overview of the Malaysian property sector. We congratulate him on his recent election as the vice president of the 188 year old Chartered Institute of Building. He will be the first Malaysian and the second Asian to be the president of this august institution when he takes office in 2022. To cover what is happening in the property sector in the UK, we welcome Hugh Dixon of Knight Frank, which has been in the real estate sector um, an area since it was founded in 1896. It is one of the world's largest global property consultancies. We cannot have a UK Malaysia property webinar without including the Battersea Power Station project, the largest inward 
investment from Malaysia to the UK. Mark Hutton will be taking us through what is happening on the development. Not just annual development, it is a huge and exciting regeneration project. And it would definitely be a tourist destination when visitors come to London. Property tax planning and structuring are very important aspects uh, when you do property deals. And we are very fortunate to have with us Man Yu Chong uh, of Crow Malaysia and also Paul Fay of Crow UK to cover these aspects for us. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope you will enjoy what is in store for you and speak to you later. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairman. Uh, we're now going to uh, move into our panel of experts. And just so you know, so in order to assist with the timings, I will uh, just give some reminders about that as we get towards uh, the end of the slot. Um, but first of all, uh, Michael, may I invite you to lead us off? You're on mute, uh, Michael, at the moment. Hello, that took one minute. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, good morning to UK and also good afternoon to Malaysia. Firstly, I'd like to thank the British Malaysian Society for hosting this event and in particular, uh, kudos to the chair, Ms. Lai Mei Sim for organizing today's uh, webinar. Secondly, hi to my fellow uh, speakers and also to the participants uh, of this webinar. Uh, I've just got some texts from the UK, from friends of mine too. Uh, thanks for listening in. Thirdly, let me just set the backdrop to my talk. I'm not going to give any excuse for being partial towards uh, property uh, investment and property development for the following reasons. Uh, apart from the 40 years experience, number one, I'm a battle-hardened veteran of four recessions, one in the UK and three in Malaysia. I survive every time only to find out the property prices and values go higher post-recession compared with the pre-recession prices. Number two, unless there's mass migration, property has a captive market, especially if there is strong population growth and the population is young and the country's socioeconomic fundamentals are strong and robust. Thirdly, a strong and pragmatic political leadership that knows when to intervene and smoothen the peak and troughs of supply and demand and volatility of prices. And this is very important because of the uh, impact it has on 140 upstream and downstream industries. We just pray for better leadership uh, than what we have got now, I suppose, uh, to promote property even better. Fourthly, when I introduce property to foreign buyers, I would advise that they must understand Malaysia and its ecosystem. Uh, its strength in diversity and its first world infrastructure with English as its main commercial language and a Westminster style government. Thank God we drive also on the right side of the road. Hence, to know Malaysia is to love Malaysia, you don't just buy a home, but invest in the neighborhood. With that, I will quickly run through some of the fundamental socio economic and demography of Malaysia before I deep dive into the property sector which due to time's constraint, I shall delve more on the residential segment. Uh, so here you are, quick facts. You see on the left column, United Kingdom, on the right, Malaysia. Uh, in fact, Malaysia is slightly larger in land mass than the UK, population about half, but look at the population uh, growth. I'm not sure whether it's on this slide, but you will see that we have, uh, okay, there we go. Okay, let's look at 2010, UK 63.4 million, net population uh, 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 Malaysia uh, 360,000, uh, UK 254,000. So although UK has got twice the population size, 
we have a larger net population growth. Uh, with COVID, that, you, that could even translate to bigger numbers. Quick facts of Malaysia, I think that's uh, for you to read. Uh, population growth, uh, very strong, GNI per capita, GDP growth, 0.7% uh, at the first quarter, mainly it's just pre-COVID, uh, but last year we ended at about 4.5. Uh, low and stable unemployment rate, about 3.5%. Fundamentals of Malaysia, next slide. Okay, more uh, data on, uh, on the population, but look at the housing supply. On the left-hand uh, box, you find that the average housing approval is 142,000 units. The estimated average demand is about 150,000 to 180,000 units. So supply and demand almost balance with demand slightly higher than uh, the uh, supply side. Next. So fundamentals remain supportive of growth. Malaysia's e key economic indicators. There we go. Uh, the charts that uh, that the uh, economics, the statistics department churns out, just to show that we are fairly resilient. Uh, of course, uh, globally, you will notice that the uh, world's economy has been uh, impacted. Uh, 2020, Malaysia expected to be negative negative 3.1 but it will rebound back in 2021 with a forecast of 6.9%. So it's a little bit of a reset, uh, but everyone has more or less written off 2020, but now looking forward to 2021. World Bank doing business 2020 report. So we are ranked 12 uh, with 81.5 points amongst 190 global economy. So we are actually punching above our weight. Next. Uh, Malaysia's international ranking, so you see first in Southeast Asia as a world energy city, second in Southeast Asia for ease of doing business, third in global services uh, in terms of location uh, by MNCs to set up uh, BPOs and global services. Uh, these are all the uh, advantages of Malaysia as almost like a first world economy. I think this, I'll leave it to you all to read for your, uh, yourself. You have all the business ranking, the lifestyle friendly uh, ecosystem that uh, Malaysia has built up. But if you look at uh, the uh, right hand side, uh, 88 least expensive city, Kuala Lumpur. And we are only an hour's flight from Singapore, which is probably ranked number one or number two uh, in terms of being the most expensive city in the world. Business friendly environment, there we go again, pretty good ranking. Uh, um, so this, these are some of the, some of the uh, advantages and the, and the qualities that multinational companies are looking for when they uh, uh, invest in a country outside their own, their own motherland. Next. What are the key uh, differentiating factor? Uh, attractive mix of demography and strong economic growth, cultural diversity and affinity with the region, uh, spoken languages that serve Asia Pacific, uh, driven by mass migration from China and India over three generations. Uh, but English is the main commercial language. Uh, as you probably know, we follow the English Westminster style of government and most of the uh, top management and executive are generally graduates from UK uh, Australia and the US in that order uh, and we have plenty uh, many universities here producing a lot of talent. Uh, just uh, some comparison on the cost effectiveness of Malaysia if you look at the bottom prime office gross effective rent uh, 1.42 US dollar per square foot per month in terms of office rental that's probably what you pay in service charge in, uh, in, the, in the city of London. Average cost of talent, again, pretty cheap. Uh, you will see that uh, we are very affordable in terms of uh, talent. Uh, look at the Ritz Carlton room charge. Uh, it's like one third of anything that Hong Kong and Singapore charges. And you have now international schools. Is, we are a very popular destination now for people seeking international boarding school. Uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur, a good international school charges about 11,000 
US dollar compared with twice uh, the other uh, countries. Now, if I drill down to the Malaysia's property sector, if you look at 2010 to 2019, over 10 years, uh, the, the all house price index is essentially double. So that's an aggregate growth of almost 10% every year. So what I'm saying is that if you have purchased a house, a landed house at 100,000 US dollar, you can bet your last bottom dollar that in 10 years time is going to be 200,000 US dollar. Uh, here, I'm just giving you a quick snapshot of the price change of detached houses from 1990 to uh, 2019, 20 years. And you can see that red graph. There are only uh, a couple of years when it dipped. Uh, that's probably the Asian financial crisis, but it just goes all the way up. Uh, Lended is very steady and uh, very uh, resilient, but even looking at high rise properties, we are really talking about condominiums and strata properties. That's also pretty, the uh, trajectory is also pretty uh, much upwards. And uh, terrace houses, which is the bread and butter of Malaysian property, all the way going up with very little dip. Next. Can I just give you a three minute cursor reminder, please? Okay, now look at the house price index again, 1990 to 2019. And uh, overlaid on this are all the crises, right? You have the Asian financial crisis, the SARS, the global financial crisis, all the way is just going up. So if you place some money here, whether it's on a 10 year cycle or 20 year cycle, it is upwards, as good as gold. Uh, this is a snapshot of the uh, global property price index, generally upwards, except for the more expensive countries like probably Singapore and Hong Kong, where the dips are a bit more serious. Next slide. Why invest in Malaysia? Uh, okay, I think that's for you to read. These are all the good points. Uh, right, next. Residential ownership options. Uh, generally two types of land, freehold or leasehold. Leasehold is 99 years. Uh, very clear uh, title of ownership. You get a title for landed and you get a strata title for your uh, multi-story or strata property. Next. Investment opportunities. Okay. Uh, as I sh uh, shared earlier in my earlier slides, very strong property trend. Uh, now the attention is towards green development. Uh, very important, ease of borrowing, plenty of liquidity in the market. In fact, foreigners can quite easily get 60%, even up to 60% loan. Very familiar banks uh, around, HSBC, uh, Standard Chartered Bank, Citibank, and some, some of the uh, Singaporean banks too. Uh, some of the areas that uh, the property players are, are, are focusing on, uh, health metropolis, uh, we've now become a popular destination for uh, medical tourism. Uh, now, international brand of education, if you look below there, uh, you have Curtin University, Monash, we have University of Nottingham here, it's a full branch campus, University of Southampton, University of Newcastle, University of Reading, uh, University of Harriet Watt. We have even bo two boarding schools, probably top 10 in the UK, Marlborough and also Epson College. Okay, next slide. Low transaction costs. Uh, this is the things like stamp duty, like your conveyancing costs uh, and the various uh, agency costs and whatever you, we are probably one of the lowest in the world. Next. High yield, uh, that's for you to see. Uh, just look at on the right hand side, rental yields uh, for residential property in Malaysia is about 3.72%. And if you look at the box at the bottom, your borrowing rates are at about 3.25%. So it's a positive carry, which is a very rare feature uh, in terms of global uh, investment return on property. The next video slide will be very, uh, very quick. This is uh, uh, some of the uh, beautiful photograph of, of development uh, built by some of our developers. Um, when you buy an apartment in London versus an apartment in Malaysia, you get for that price uh, all these features swimming pools tennis courts badminton courts plus three car parks whereas in most places in london all you get is a apartment and if you want a car park you actually pay for it so you're you're buying the neighborhood with all this feature uh, this is tourism malaysia and I, my last slide is just i think a one minute uh 
uh, uh, video clip on the, on the, the city of Kuala Lumpur just to entice those who haven't been here. Tourism is also pretty cheap. Uh, so I'm not sure, uh, David, whether this video keep, clip could be played. Let me check with our tech team. I imagine the answer might be no. Do we have a video clip to play? Is there a video? That was the video, the last one, the picture. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think we can share it with everyone after, David. I can't access it. Okay. Okay. If not, I'll just send across another one. Uh, Rev, is it okay? We can do it at the end. Yeah, at the end. But I'll, I'll send another video clip to you. Yeah, if you send it at the end, that, that might be a nice way of rounding off things. Yeah, if you could whisk that over and we'll do it in the background seamlessly. There we are. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Oh, no, no, thank you. Really, really fascinating because you, you've got the hard job of putting the framework uh, in place. And thank you for your, your timings, which is most uh, most appreciated. I can go for my beer now. <laughs> Not yet, you can't. You've still got the questions and answers. So hang around a bit. Uh, <laughs> So you kindly spoke to us about being cost effective, there's strong property trends, ease of borrowing, low transaction costs, and also mentioned uh, foreigners, uh, we can get 60% loans possibly, and you even get a, a free car parking place uh, uh, thrown in as well. So what more could one ask for? Fantastic, thank you very much. I would now like to uh, invite Hugh Dixon uh, to speak to us. Hugh, over to you, sir. Good morning uh, and good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Hugh Dixon. Uh, I work at Knight Frank in, here in London. I sit within a team uh, called the Private Office, which looks after the global key clients for the business. Uh, these clients generally tend to have um, multiple uh, global real estate requests, whether that being residential, commercial or, uh, or overseas. Uh, we're based in London and we're a conduit into, into the Knight Frank. Uh, global network. So uh, today I'll try and give you a brief overview of, of the UK market and where we think uh, opportunities lie for investors. Um, next slide please. Thank you. Uh, so outlook and opportunity. So with regards to the UK property scene and, and perhaps um, in particular London, we, we currently feel that this is one of the best buying opportunities in, in nearly a decade. Um, despite well-documented kind of near-term challenges, factors including uh, current pricing, currency movements and, and interest rates, um, and recent stamp duty cuts means that London market is offering, we think, one of the best buying opportunities in, in nearly 10 years. Um, like all major economic sectors, the property market you know, was hit you know, hit one of the hardest and hit by the shock of the pandemic and, and government reaction to it. That said, as the economy reopens, the market is coming back to life. So whilst it appears too early probably to, to quantify the true impact of the pandemic, recent market trends indicate that there are, you know, are causes for optimism amid uncertainty and particularly for the UK capital and the, and the prime markets. If we go back slightly, in the, in the months preceding the lockdown, the UK market experienced a quite, quite a rally in response and what was dubbed as, as the Boris bounce, um, following Boris Johnson's convincing win in, in, in last December's election. Um, house prices and sales climbed and, and on the back of the political certainty um, delivered by one of the first viable kind of majority governments for nearly 10 years. Um, but despite the evident fallout from, from COVID-19, the new political situation in the UK remains a strong foundation to build on, um, particularly amid you know, the pent-up demand stimulated by, by the lockdown. Um, in fact, some of our figures we've recorded recently, the number of new buyers looking for homes in excess of £3 million has increased by 53% since lockdown measures were eased. So and we're, we're comparing this to, to the five year average. So if we go on to the next slide and, and look at investment opportunities and, and let's for a moment stick to London residential, whilst London is facing the simultaneous threat of, of, of Brexit and COVID, I think well, we think is well placed to weather the storm. Investors continue to recognize the value 
in Prime London um, and Prime London assets that can that, that add to their investment portfolios. Um, true global city um, and thus far its status as the world's leading financial hub does, does stay intact. Um, the, the city's resilience, let's say, is, is propelled by the persistent interest uh, from international investors. Uh, at Night Frank, we continue to see strong demand, particularly from Hong Kong, China, Singapore, and the Middle East, uh, with an influx uh, of capital from private wealth funds and family offices. Um, in Asia alone, ultra high net worths are expected to grow by 44% in the next five years. And we anticipate that this international investment into major European cities like London uh, will continue to go from, from strength to strength. So let's think, where does this opportunity now lie for investors? Well, in, in central London boroughs, prices are now 40% cheaper compared to their levels in 2014, once you take into market and currency movements into account. Um, at present, international buyers are able to capitalise on favourable currency discounts, making London investment quite a compelling opportunity. Uh, what's more, when inflation is taken into account, this saving increases up to circa 50%. So another noticeable trend that is encouraging the market is, is also that our clientele is getting younger. 80% um, of our buyers spending over £10 million are now below the age of 50. So if we, if we leave London for the moment and look at outer London and, and, and the countryside, the crisis, the COVID crisis has raised questions whether it has prompted a permanent shift away from urban living. So our clients are increasingly looking at properties which offer the, the kind of luxury of outdoor space and, and greater privacy, uh, which we can, we can you know, prove scarce um, to come by in a busy metropolis. So, you know, our, our latest figures have revealed a noticeable boost in country sales um, over the lockdown period, suggesting that, that, you know, outside of London may have been the main benefactor of the crisis. Um, needless to say, we still think, you know, international buyers tend to favour the capital just because of its, you know, global appeal and, and connectivity. Um, so, so into kind of going into summary i'll touch upon you know commercial as well um you know demand will be particularly evident in central london which carries you know the the, the benefit of of simple and, and short commutes and lifestyle um a key restraint to note is is the demand continues to outmatch supply so with new build volumes on the decline since the market's peak in 2014 um However, we're, we're noticing that investors are eager to diversify their portfolios, turning to the likes of, of the private rented scheme and, and, and student housing. So, so just to go on to the commercial market, with the pandemic, this meant that in Q2 of this year, there was a real pause on UK commercial investment. Investment volumes were down 90%. Um, and, and as we come out of July into August, you know, these transactions have really ramped up. Um, London commercial is robust and, and you know, investors are looking for long income deals going forward. Um, obviously, retail is, is suffering um, and I think there's going to be a real repositioning of this in the next three to five years. Um, the one main trend that came out of commercial um, during, during kind of lockdown and COVID is, is the trend of e-commerce uh, with everyone working from home and going online to, to get groceries and shopping and all sorts. This translated into you know, a, a, a real boom in logistics space and investment. Um, you know, for example, supermarkets are still performing very well and dominating so dominating that market. So, um, in summary, um, I think that the, the kind of main takeaways is that you know, once COVID and Brexit concerns ease, we anticipate there will be a more sustained pickup in in the prime market, um, which would underpin values. So. Uh, and then secondly, prime, the prime property in central London arguably looks good uh, value for, for, for years of fairly muted growth, particularly for those buying in, in foreign currencies. So um, if uh, you go on to the next slide, um, you know, we'd, we'd be happy to, to answer any questions at the end or, or after this and, and give advice to any of, of your clients or, or yourselves going forward in, in the UK property market.
Excellent. Uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Hugh, uh, for that. Some of the some of the statistics uh, which I, I wrote down very very interesting. Um, talking about the best buying opportunity possibly in in ten years, and inquiries. I think you said for three million pounds upward property uh, up fifty three uh, percent, um, and you talked about uh, all in the round uh, forty percent uh, price cuts as it were compared to uh, twenty fourteen. Uh, circa 50% if you put it in inflation, clientele's getting younger, outside London might be increasing in demand and a winner as it were from, from COVID, commercial properties still very much uh, on buyers lists um, and also that demand outstrips uh, supply. So thank you very much, uh, a nice, a nice uh, segue there uh, with Michael's uh, comments. Um, we're now going to turn over to, uh, to Munyu to speak to us about the Malaysian uh, property tax and related issues. Over to you, sir. Forgive me, mistake, intentional mistake. It's Mark Hutton, uh, in fact, Battersea Power Station. And I did that because we're transferring um, screen sharing and that was just really to talk about it while they get it all sorted out. And now there seems to be two of me on the screen, which is which is a, a uh, complex thing because I'm looking over at a second monitor. OK, Mark, I think I've spoken enough. We're ready. Go for it, please. Fantastic. Is that coming through clearly with, 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 uh, with our logo on the screen? All good. Fantastic. Right. Morning, uh, everyone. Afternoon, everyone in Malaysia and, and from, from other parts of the world joining us. Uh, and just a quick thanks, obviously, David, for preparing um, and obviously Mason for organising. Uh, much appreciated and great to be here. Um, I'm going to try and go through this as quickly as possible. The Bassey Power Station development obviously sat on the banks of the River Thames, uh, an incredible investment by the nation of Malaysia, um, and without whose support we couldn't be making this happen. So we are, we are, we are so grateful to the input and support that they provide to us here uh, in London in, in our ability to try and regenerate this extraordinary opportunity. Um, for those who are familiar with it already, you'll, you'll be aware that obviously Estesetia, Simon Darby Property, uh, EPF and PMV are the sort of key uh, supporters and stakeholders and shareholders in this extraordinary project. And as I said, without their, we, we, without their support, we couldn't be making this happen. So, so a huge amount of thanks goes to them, um, of course. In terms of what we're doing, and I'm going to try and get through this as quickly as possible, there is a lot to cover with a project of this scale. Um, 42 acres, it's the largest planning consent ever granted in central London. It is in London's central activity zone, sat at the sort of southwest corner of that. Um, an enormous scheme, as I said, 42 acres. It is almost split uh, half and half in terms of residential and commercial. The numbers you see on the screen there, 57% resi and 43% commercial, allude to what we have consented in our master plan, but uh, we will probably end up somewhere closer to a 50-50 mix uh, by, by the end of the project. Um, it'll be a huge attraction on a global level uh, with, with circa 40 million visits anticipated every year. This, this would make it busier than Covent Garden. So a, a really, really extraordinary town centre being created in central London and with a huge amount of public realm, 18 acres of open space, which given the current climate, uh, it obviously becomes even more valuable in the current uh, situation we're in. Now, uh, the numbers you've just seen to, to, to really facilitate both a properly mixed use development, but also the number of visitors that you will anticipate because of the retail, the office provisions and the residents living here, you need to be able to tap into the mass transit system and therefore a key bit of infrastructure is us working with Transport for London and delivering a new uh, Northern Line extension, so a new Zone 1 tube station. That will be coming here and opening in autumn 2021. Now that gives you incredible connectivity. So uh, an incredible driver for the site, a huge value added driver as it were. Without that you wouldn't have some of the retail tenants and office tenants coming as well as some of the residential investors. You can see on this picture here how it branches off from Kennington through Nine Elms ending up at Battersea Power Station. This will take you to Bank Station, for example, in about 12 minutes. So Zone 1 connected uh, Northern Line Extension. So a fantastic bit of infrastructure um, serving, servicing the uh, development. Opening this time next year, so very, very exciting. Uh, quick video. Um, this was actually done over a year ago when they first laid the tracks. And I don't know whether the sound's coming through. You might have heard a little choo-choo. Anyway, it's, uh, here it is, testing out the tracks over a year ago now, coming through the Nine Elms Station. And I hope these guys on the left keep out of the way. And as we move ourselves through the line, ultimately ending up here at Battersea Power Station, 
as it says here, this is the first major tube line since the Jubilee, Jubilee was uh, brought to us at the end of the 1990s. So that is operational as of early, uh, sorry, as of autumn next year. Key bit of infrastructure. Already servicing us well is, of course, the Thames Clipper, uh, now sponsored by Uber, I believe. So um, great to have that service sort of up and running, a fantastic way to get up and down the banks of the River Thames. Uh, again, as alluded to earlier, very lucky with the green space and what we have here in London. You know, almost half of London is covered by green space, and we're very lucky. We're sat next to Battersea Park with 200 acres of fantastic green space with its own zoo right next to us on the banks of the River Thames. Um, and of course, as I said, we have our own, you know, 18 acres of public realm as well. So uh, a really, really good offering with a focus on well-being in today's society uh, right up there. Phase one, uh, this is a seven-phase development. Now, we have delivered phase one. We are in the process of delivering phases two and three, and the future phases will, will, will unfold over future years. But I'll just go through these quickly just to bring you up to speed on where we are. So phase one, sat to the west of the power station, in front of the river, a fantastic part of the development already up and running, 865 apartments fully occupied. Our residents here and our owners in particular are benefiting from a great uh, rental and capital appreciation, and I'll touch on that in a minute. But it is, uh, you know, what we did focus on was on a bit of community. And we examples are things like the London Seafood Festival, which we had the inaugural one a few years ago here with 25,000 people down here over a weekend. The following year, with the second one, we had uh, 45,000 people down. Obviously, this year, uh, we, we've had to put things on hold uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but it's just an emphasis on bringing people together, creating a community. And that's been a huge factor in why the rental growth and the capital appreciation has been so positive here. As you can see, Prime London working last year at a sort of average growth of just under 1%. We are sitting at subs just under 6% um, over annual growth last year. So um, a real, really great opportunity and you know, things seem to be going very, very well here for those investors. And of course, that also plays into the capital appreciation side where for those who had bought um, in 2013 or 14 when we were first bringing that phase to market, you, know, or you would have seen on average a 36% increase in your capital value on top of that fantastic rental growth that we're seeing as well. So um, as an asset, it is performing very, very well for those who invested. This just gives you a little idea of, of, of one of our apartments there, just to sort of give you a flavor for the quality and also the, the setting, you know, right here on the river, fantastic views from some of these apartments, you know, really spectacular sort of residential offerings that we are, are providing here. Uh, obviously, the London backdrop at night being um, you know, one of those lovely iconic views. Um, now, phase two itself, uh, the power station. You know, this is the, the you know, to coin a uh, probably an overused phrase in many many forms. The the, the jewel in the crown, um, sat at the heart of, of, of being the biggest brick building in Europe. An extraordinary, extraordinary building, um, and you know that that really is the sort of main attraction here. Uh, as it says here, you can see those sort of asset classes split into 250 odd apartments, uh, over half a million square feet of office space, and then 110 retail and food and beverage units, uh, on top of a 2,000 person capacity events venue. So the, the, it really is you know, it, it, a huge offering in this incredible building. Um, and just some images here which give you an idea of how it's going to look. That's looking at some of the residential sat on the top of the boiler house between the chimneys, an idea of one of those interiors and how it'll look. Again, you know, beautiful, beautiful spaces. Um, how some of the office space will look, and I can't show you um, the detail of this just yet because of a certain tenant, which I'll touch on in a minute, um, but really fantastic. The retail offering as well, you know, fantastic. Uh, again, as everyone is aware, the high street's in a bit of a tough position at the moment. And the retail sector is very much sort of leaning towards those that either have a very strong online presence or an experiential element. And I think with this building, if you can see the architecture clearly enough, you can realize that you know, when you're inside here as, as, as a retail consumer, you really could, you know, you couldn't be anywhere else. And, and I think that that's playing into our, into our hands at the moment. And a lot of interesting conversations going on with retail tenants. The event space, as I touched on, a fantastic venue, whether it's, you know, music performances or the BAFTA awards, you name it. It's going to be a fantastic venue for London. A quick cross-section of the building to give you an idea of how it's split. If you imagine the river is behind what you're looking at rather than in front. So you to the left-hand side, Turbine Hall A, built in the 1930s before the Second World War, and Turbine Hall B, 
on the right hand side which is built after the second world war and that's sort of you will see the difference in the architecture in terms of the sort of almost art deco opulence of the pre-world war era followed by the austerity that naturally came following the second world war in terms of internally you can see a little bit in terms of where the residential elements are sat where the apple offices are and again i'll touch on that in a second in a bit more detail and then turbine halls a and b where the retail will sit these fantastic sort of incredible sort of shopping halls the building itself now, things have progressed significantly since this aerial shot was taken. Um, uh, we had something like 19 cranes on the site. We, we don't have anywhere near that now. The building has made significant advances, but we've had to rebuild the chimneys. Uh, we have huge amounts of operatives just you know, on the power station itself, over 2,000 on site. So, um, you know, and in terms of the steel connections, the number you see there, I think an easier way to think of it is there's three and a half times the amount of steel on the power station than there is in the Eiffel Tower that helps put it into perspective. How some of that, that is now looking, fantastic on the western side of Turbine Hall A. A three minute courtesy uh, reminder please. Yeah, I'll get whizzing. Uh, how it's looking now from the east, so you can see significant progress in you know, absolutely stunning residential apartments sat there on the tops of the switch houses and the boiler house. This is just a, a, a quick snippet of one of the show apartments inside. This is a little one bed flat inside the power station, but again, just highlighting the quality of what is being delivered here in this extraordinary development. We'll see the original brickwork, the crittle windows that have been put in. Um, so there's a huge amount of detail going into preserving this grade two star listed building, as well as leaning on those architectural elements to sort of bring it back to life in a fantastic light. So a fantastic offering here. Again, a couple of images just to showcase how that's looking from a residential. Now, Apple, as I've touched on, this will be their London headquarters. Um, a huge tenant to be having coming here. Fantastic for us, the largest brand, the biggest brand on the planet. Uh, fantastic that they're coming. They've got six floors sat between the chimneys in the boiler house. Each floor is about two acres, if that helps give you a sense of scale. We have additional workspace as well, going to number 18, who are part of the IWG group. And that's a very exciting sort of offshoot, uh, Scandinavian offshoot of theirs um, called number 18. So we're thrilled to have them coming. Again, just an idea of some of that retail idea and a mood board in terms of the types of brands that we're in talks with. We've already announced some of those that are going to be letting here and there'll be further announcements as we move forward, but it's very exciting to see some of this element coming together. As I said at the beginning, this is a mixed use scheme. There is everything from office space to retail to residential and fantastic architecture that helps sort of create somewhere very, very unique event spaces, um, bringing back all these key features um, which is absolutely brilliant. A chimney lift, you know, if we weren't making life hard enough for ourselves with, with a building like this already, we've gone and decided to put a little sort of uh, glass uh, panoramic across London on the top of the Northwest chimney with a sort of Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator style approach. As you pop up through one of the through the chimney out into this incredible panoramic across London. So a fantastic offering. I'll now whiz through phase three and then, and then, and then that'll be me done. So I won't take any, uh, too much more time. Um, phase three, which sits to the south of the power station, as you can see here, with the electric boulevard running through the middle of it, which will be another high street of retail running from the tube at the southern end up to the power station at the northern end. Here we go, running through from the southern end where the tube comes out through these incredible buildings with the Foster designed roof gardens on the left and the Geary designed prospect place on the right as you arrive at the power station with Malaysia Square sat in front of the power station as this sort of central meeting point. Incredible architecture, fantastic roof gardens. As you can see, for those who are familiar with Geary's work, absolutely striking and very clearly Frank Geary, his only UK residential work and we're thrilled that it's coming here. The roof gardens, which will be London's largest roof garden and one of the highest roof gardens in London, sat at the base of the height of the chimneys uh, and uh, you know, offering fantastic, again, outside space, great views um, across London. So again, in a headline grabbing outside space, great architecture, as I said, Norman Foster's team doing the Battersea roof gardens and Frank Geary doing the prospect place. So uh, it just gives you an idea, again, some of the residential elements, these are fantastic apartments within this extraordinary mixed-use development. In terms of how it's looking again, you'll very clearly see that Geary element in terms of the architectural elements there looking in. And just to summarize sort of where we are in terms of why Battersea Power Station, why we believe, all biasy aside, this is going to be one of the greatest opportunities in London. You have a global icon, the building itself, you know, globally recognized. You have a great location, 
in terms of you know, the southwest pocket of, of London's central activity zone. You have a great emphasis on sustainability, community, uh, economy. You, you know, we're going to be providing 20,000 jobs into the local economy. So there is a real emphasis on this sort of sustainability element. Apple, we've touched on that, biggest brand on the planet, one of the largest listed companies on the planet, needs probably no more talking, but great to have their endorsement and have them coming. The tube line, probably wouldn't have Apple without the tube line, one of the most significant key drivers of the site, but again, that key bit of infrastructure to allow you in and out. Being on the river, outside space, well-being, proximity to water, and all of that is, a, is, is, is very much higher up the agenda for people's decision-making as we move forward, and that, I think that will remain forevermore. And in terms of assets, it's performed well, already a proven performer with phase one delivering those returns. So investors have benefited so far. We see that only continuing when you look at all those key drivers coming in, the tube station, Apple, the retail, once that all starts to kick in, those investments should continue, if not increase the rate at which they have been growing. So we see that as a very positive thing. And again, mixed use, retail, office, Everything that comes with it, it really is an extraordinary project. There is nothing like it. And uh, as I said, we're grateful to be part of it and seriously, significantly grateful for the investment shown by our Malaysian shareholders. A nice little image to end things off to give you an idea of, of how incredible this place is going to look. Um, so thank you for your time. Um, and I will hand back uh, the presentation. Obviously, we're here to answer questions at the end, and I'll hand back the presentation now. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting. And of course, the, the BMS, we did have a. Uh a couple of visits uh, to the site, so it's good to see that, that things are developing. And as a bit of a, a transport buff myself, it's always good to have a bit, a bit of tube imagery there, and I did like the quick toot at the beginning. Uh, we have had one comment that apparently uh, one of our members is disappointed you didn't mention uh, Pink Floyd's album using Fantasy Power Station. So I've done it now, so we've covered all those bases. Um, now, Mun Yu, we're over to you, sir. This is not a false alarm. You're now live. Off you go, sir. Thank you, David. Um, next slide. Okay, I will just uh, highlight to you the uh, current tax uh, development property issues in Malaysia. Next. Okay, this is my profile. Next. Okay, these are the agenda that I would like to cover. Okay, next. Okay, next. Yeah, uh, this is for foreign property ownership in Malaysia. Generally, there's a minimum threshold of 1 million, but the budget 2020 uh, has been lowered to 600 for high-rise property and also limited to 2020 only. But some uh, foreigners may participate under the Malaysia My Second Home. So the threshold will be lower depending on the respective states in Malaysia. Next slide. Okay, this uh, slide just to highlight that there are this, this badges of trade issue that you need to take care of. Uh, investment in property, if the, uh, you fall in, under these badges of trade, you may fall under income tax if you fulfill uh, some of these conditions. Uh, if not, then you will be under uh, capital gains under real property gain tax. Next slide. Okay, for real property gain tax, uh, generally is charged on the chargeable gain. It also applies to shares and uh, rubric tax and income tax they are mutually exclusive. Uh, chargeable person includes everybody, whether you're a resident or non-resident. Person includes everybody, including a company partnership. Next slide. Okay, next. Okay, this is just to highlight to you some of the rates of the RBGT. You have companies citizen PR and non-citizen non-PR. So depending on the number of years you hold a property, the rates will apply accordingly. Uh, this RBGD exemption is in relation to private residents, uh, but this is only for Malaysian residents and also the uh, PR. And you have a once in a lifetime uh, exemption. Uh, next is under 2020, Malaysian citizen given the uh, three properties. If you sell within a period, three properties will be exempted. Uh, this is the responsibility of the seller, the form, the uh, due date, and the penalty for non-compliance. Next. This is the responsibility acquirers, the form, the due dates, penalties, and the respective uh, documents. Next slide. Okay, this is just to show you that the notice of assessment and the uh, certificate of non-chargeability will be issued once you file the return. Also, there's a possibility there will be some refund 
of uh, RBGT if there's a cancellation of uh, sales purchase agreement, disposal exempted, and also RBGT overpaid. Next slide. Okay, stamp duty implication. Uh, generally, stamp duty is applicable to the instruments and also document. And uh, there are two rates. One is a 10 ringgit, the other is an abelarum. And uh, if you, the abelarum, it will be applicable for transfer of property 1 to 4%, depending on the market value or consideration, whichever higher. Next. Okay, this uh, 2020, there's this exemption where it says that from 1st June 2020 to 31st May 2021, the loan agreement can be fully exempted. Then uh, the next one will be on partial exemption, where anything below 1 million will be exempted. Anything, the value above 1 million, only the above will be subject to a stamp duty of 3%. Okay, next slide. Okay, these are the, just show you the consequences of a late stamping of the document. Three months, six months, and above six months. So you have a 5%, 10%, and 20%. Next slide. Okay, others. Uh, letting out property in Malaysia, you have rental income. Generally, it will be subject to tax, depending whether you are resident or non-resident. Resident is 1 to 30%, non-resident flat rate of 30%, effective 2020. Uh, next. Okay, I have finished my sharing. David, pass it back to you. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Well, well done. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Meng Yu, for that. You covered a, a terrific amount of territory. Uh, talking about gains tax uh, and stamp duty as well. I noticed one to four percent. That sounds like a, a bit of a bargain, shall we say? And very interested to note there's a stamp duty uh, exemption there as well. Uh, you know, we're, we're experiencing this uh, here uh, in in the UK as well. So excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Mung Yu. Uh, Paul Fay. So may I call upon you to to give your impressions from the the UK side, Paul? Thank you, David. Um, next slide, please. Um, well, thank you for inviting me. My name is Paul Fay. I'm a corporate tax partner in Crow London. Uh, next slide, please. Um, very limited time and UK property tax is a huge area. So we'll really just scratch the surface and try to flag some of the issues that you will need to consider. And let's look at first of UK nationals investing into Malaysian property. If you are a UK tax resident, you are subject to UK tax um, on, on all your worldwide income and gains. You would normally get double tax relief where, let's say, Malaysia has taxed something first. Um, so you shouldn't suffer from double tax. Uh, however, you would want to think carefully on how you structure your investment because the UK tax rates can be very different. Um, there are obviously a number of potential ways you can buy something personally. You could set up a UK company or a, perhaps a Malaysian company to do it. Um, you could do it through a partnership and, and normally in the UK a partnership is transparent. I, you look straight through it and treat the partners as if they've done the transactions directly. But, but just to illustrate this, um, UK gains tax various rates up to 28%. Uh, UK income tax starts at 20%, going up to a top rate of 45. Um, UK dividends tax uh, various rates up to 38%. Um, and UK corporation tax at 19%. Um, now, if, if our UK chap uh, sets up a Malaysian company to, to acquire the property. No immediate UK corporation tax, um, but there will, there will be tax when dividends are paid back to the UK shareholder. Also need to be very careful that you don't have UK directors on that company or the company could end up UK tax resident anyway. I'd also flag there's a lot of UK anti-avoidance rules which can effectively apportion gains and income from, say, a Malaysian company up to the UK shareholder. Um, many of these would not apply where there's a genuine commercial rather than a tax-driven structure. And, and, and a very broad rule of thumb, 
if you're using something like a Malaysian company to invest in Malaysia property, that sounds very commercial. If you're using something like a BVI entity, you may struggle to make the commercial argument. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, just looking um, at the other way, where you've got Malaysian nationals investing into the UK. Um, if we'd been doing this a few years ago, I'd have been telling you about all the wonderful tax advantages non-residents enjoy on UK property. And over the last four or five years, we've seen a number of changes really designed to level the playing field. And we are just about the stage now when a, a non-UK investor is, is treated the same as a UK investor in terms of UK tax. Um, but there is again the need to consider the, how you come in. Do you come in personally, directly? Do you come in through a UK company or a non-UK company? Uh, I mean, increasingly a non-UK company is taxed as the same way as a UK UK company would be and quite often people are using UK companies just for the simplicity. Um, there can be advantages still in using non-UK companies, SDLT for example, um, commercial prop purposes, um, UK companies have to make very full disclosures, to public disclosures, um, sometimes people don't like that. Um, now, I would also flag one thing everyone used to do a lot is you'd set up a UK company that would acquire the UK property and then you would sell the shares in the UK company to largely avoid UK taxes. That unfortunately has effectively been closed down and, and if you try to do that structure, uh, you end up taxed as if you'd sold the, company, the, the property effectively. Um, also, uh, unfortunate for, for Malaysian investors, we, we've got a 2% S stamp duty land tax surcharge, which is coming in in respect of UK residential property from April 2021. Um, I think many people viewed it as a political rather than a totally rational move, but, but it is happening and we can't undo it. Um, next slide, please. Um, as well as the main sort of corporate ta income taxes, gains taxes, there are a few others that you should consider. UK stamp duty land tax is now a very significant cost, up to 17% on residential from next April with the 2% surcharge, 15% today. But, you know, if you're investing in some of these, uh, more expensive 10 million or whatever properties, the sort of things that, uh, that Hugh was talking about earlier, there will be a significant SDLT cost. Uh, commercial property is a 5% rate, so um, obviously much lower. There is also something called annual tax on enveloped dwellings, which as the name suggests is an annual charge and it's made on residential properties worth more than half a million. It's on a sliding scale. So I think at the top end where you've got properties worth more than 20 million, it's a 240 odd thousand pounds annual charge. It is really intended to stop people that are looking to buy UK properties through companies. Um, which was thought in the past that a way a number of people were trying to hide identities and so on. Can I just give um, three minutes uh, courtesy reminder, please? Thank you. Um, there are exemptions from that for bona fide investors and, and developers. So uh, if you're coming in to buy a property to rent out to third parties or, or to buy it to refurbish and sell it on, you won't need to pay the tax, but you will need to uh, make the return. VAT should also be borne in mind. It really only comes into play on commercial properties. Um, the, the system is complex, but VAT, where, where, where in the past an election to apply VAT has been made, VAT continues to apply. Uh, sometimes when VAT does apply, you can still manage to get an exempt transfer. Um, and the key, or one key issue is if you do have to pay VAT, are you in a position to recover it? Um, 
in, in interest and penalties, nearly everything I've talked about involves various tax returns by various due dates and, and payments of amounts due. Interest penalties arise for, for failing to make those returns. And I would just flag some of you fairly quickly, you know, some are sort of 30 days after a transaction. So you do need to understand what is due. Next slide, please. So really, just, just to wrap up, um, I would emphasise that is a real fly through of, of, of what are often complex, detailed, lengthy provisions. And there are other anti avoidance rules around that can apply in certain circumstances. And it really is important to take detailed specialist advice based on your circumstances, your objectives and, and, and the transaction in question. Make sure all taxes are covered up front. I, I, I've seen people do something to save, let's say, income tax and suddenly realise they've triggered an annual ATED cost. Um, and bear in mind that different structures can have a very significant impact on the amount of UK tax that is due. Uh, next slide, please. Just included there my uh, contact details if, if anyone wants to come back later, have any later thoughts. Uh, so, so thank you and back to you, David. Excellent. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Paul. That nicely uh, fitted on from where Munyu uh, uh, finished off. Uh, instant comments there about uh, anti-avoidance. And the one I picked up on, you know, be careful in the composition uh, of the board. Um, and then Personal UK. A non UK company, and obviously significant differences there in the rates of stamp duty, which caught my, my attention 17% there on Resi. And as you say, these are complex issues, so do, do get uh, some appropriate and correct uh, advice. Okay, we're into the questions and answer uh, session. Um, remember, you can vote for the different questions that's been going on, so thank you. That bring, bring him up the, the cab rank, as it were. So let me have a look, see what we have uh, in, in here. Okay, so. Hugh, it's aimed at you. Uh, interesting points on outside London. Do you have any general insights or thoughts on, are you ready for this, Scottish property, thinking about Edinburgh or Glasgow? Is that specific enough? <laughs> no, very, very, very specific. Um, and, and thank you. Um, I mean, we, we do have a bit of research um, done on, on the Scottish real estate market, which we can send you. But in, with regards to... Um, student housing was it yeah student accommodation i think you know look, there was a there was a concern not just in scotland but nationally about student housing as an investment and international students coming to the uk um which has suffered slightly given you know that they were closed but um international student figures starting this september are positive so um it's it's not like there's been an exodus of international students in in the uk or or you know uh, them coming back so that that student housing market is still uh, one of the key um, assets within a, a diversified portfolio so it's still it's still a strong market um, when, it, when it comes to specific Scottish you know property um, I think I'll have to follow up with some some key stats and, and data for you right uh, thank you now I've just thought of something there um, and Michael this might be one for you is there a kind of demand or property investment opportunity for student accommodation in Malaysia? Because you did speak about all those different universities there. Does it exist? Is it a yes or a no? Is it the same play on student accommodation in Malaysia? Uh, there is, but it's very far and few in between. Uh, offhand, I think Nottingham, which is slightly uh, remotely uh, in a, a more remote place of Kuala Lumpur, they do have uh, student accommodation. Uh, but this on a voluntary basis. Um, I think somewhere in Iskandar, where uh, Southampton University, Newcastle, and Reading, there are also uh, some uh, purpose-built student accommodation. But otherwise, you know, real estate is a pretty affordable uh, asset class in Malaysia, and people could actually rent a landed house or, or a three-room apartment uh, for a pretty affordable price. So it's, it's not like the UK where you know, um, uh, uh, they've dedicated uh, student accommodation. I think the competition is pretty stiff. Okay, great. Uh, hey. th thank you very much for that, for that insight. It just suddenly came to my mind. Um, Mark, this looks like one for you. On Battersea, uh, what's the mix of residents, local versus foreign? 
in terms of those living there as opposed to owners? Um, yeah, good question. It's inevitably a lot of the apartments were bought uh, by international investors. I think the international investors tend to understand the off-plan buying process. Uh, it is more familiar to them than perhaps it is the domestic market. And also the, the, the domestic market largely moves around circumstantial process, i.e. they are selling a property, upsizing, downsizing. So I think you know, you're naturally going to see that in the off-plan process. But when we become, as we've seen with phase one, You've had many who bought perhaps as an investment, who A, seen it perform well for them, but, but also more encouragingly is where we've seen those who bought for that purpose, who are UK buyers, but who have also then seen how fantastic the place is and decided to, to when the tenancies ended, decide to take over and live there themselves and choose this as their main residence. So we're seeing a, you know, an increasing number of, of UK owner occupiers living here. And I think we're going to see that trend continue when they, when they see the benefits of A, the community we've built, but also the outside space and all the offerings I touched on during the presentation. Um, and so it's a very healthy mix. But London being London, it, it, as I said, it is a healthy mix and you're, you're naturally going to see that, you'd expect it. Um, but, but so far, you know, we've, we've seen a very nice mix and, and good balance that, that's working well here. Great. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Mark. I'm going to look on one here. Uh, Andrew asks, why do Malaysian buyers still use BVI companies to buy property in the UK? Any comment from UK or Malaysia? Why do Malaysian buyers still use BVI companies? Anybody like to take that on for me? Uh, I mean, from, from a UK perspective, it gives, no, it gives them no particular tax advantage um, uh, over using either something like a Guernsey Jersey company um, and as I say, that there's only marginal really differences between that and using a UK company. And, and it is an issue that buyers should consider because HMRC oft, often sort of view Guernsey Jersey companies as, as, as friendlier territories than let's say BVI. And, and use of BVI companies in structures can cause HMRC in the UK to sort of, you know, scratch their heads. Is, is there some something I don't like going on here and look more carefully, um, certainly than when you use a UK company, but, but also even if you use a Guernsey Jersey company. Having said that, it may give other significant Malaysian advantages. And so, uh, great. Uh, can I just keep in there, David? Yes, please, Michael. From a Malaysian perspective, and, uh, and uh, I have a tax advisor that in the past, when you invest in the UK, you do set up a BVI company or a Guernsey or Jersey company because, as Paul has mentioned earlier, there's tax advantages. But that has now been removed. And, that, and then I would rather speculate with no validation that whoever continues with BVI company, either they're wrongly advised because they didn't go to Paul, or they may be politicians or businessmen who didn't want their identity to be known. Without right. prejudice, sorry. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Thank you for that input, uh, uh, Michael. Uh, let me pick this one up here. Uh, what is the impact of COVID-19 uh, to the market value of UK resi and commercial property? What has been the impact of COVID in terms of pricing? Hugh, might, might be that one for you? Yeah, sure. Um, we're, um, in terms of capital growth this year, I mean, we've, we've predicted kind of a general across the board kind of minus 5% with next year bouncing back up to plus 8%. Um, commercial, you know, values, ha um, you know, in terms of office and, and um, logistics has remained strong. Obviously, retail is, is suffering um, and obviously kind of shopping mall, malls as well has, has, has been affected. But Kind of general kind of um, is, is in London down five um, with, with predicted to go back up to kind of circa eight post post uh, well into next year. Great, uh, thank you very much. Uh, would anybody from the Malaysian expertise like to comment on what be, what has been the effect on property prices due to COVID in Malaysia? No takers for that one yet. Michael, thank you. Yeah, maybe a quick one. Uh, if anything, it may drive up property prices. Uh, for one, um, we have probably between probably 1.2 million to 1.5 million workers in the construction industry. 
90% of these are actually foreign workers, mainly from Indonesia or from uh, Bangladesh. Uh, because of the social distancing, uh, even right now we are in what you call the relax uh, 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 control order, uh, we find that the productivity is only about 60%. So what you're getting uh, at is you're paying full wages, but you're only getting 60% efficiency. And I think the supply chain is also similarly uh, affected. And because again of the risk of infection, we can see the repatriation of more of these foreign workers. Uh, and as such, I think cheap or cheaper labor becomes less available. And our IBS system is not quite up to scratch yet because we were never prepared for this. So I think if anything, it should drive costs up because you have now lost of economy of scale you've also now a loss of cheap labor. My quick take on it. Most kind, thank you very much. Now we're, we've essentially run out of time, but I'm gonna put Hugh on the, on the spot here for a very quick uh, uh, response. It could be yes, no, or maybe. Uh, Hugh, could we please have an update on St. John's Wood Square? Will it be built eventually? <laughs> Um, there, there is one, and I can, I can send um, information. Um, who, who's that? That was um, uh, Dip Dipak. Yes. Um, please do send me an email. Perhaps Mike could just put us in touch, and um, I can, I can send them. It will be built. It will be built. <laughs> okay. So we got a yes. There we are. Excellent. Well done. Thanks very much, Hugh. Fantastic panel. Uh, absolutely storming, and we've kept the time, which, which is absolutely great. I'd now like to, to invite uh, my colleague, one of my colleagues from the executive committee. Robin uh, Stevens to put forward the vote of thanks. Robin. Thank you, David. Um, and thank you to all, all the speakers. Um, at first, I felt a bit left out that I, that I only had one slide rather than 126, but I think on balance, it's good. Uh, although I'm, I'm told that you get paid by the number of slides, so I might borrow some of the other slides later on. Um, but thank you first to, to the uh, organizing team, particularly to David and to uh, Vanessa and Rev for, for, for uh, making it work and to Mason for, for, for um, uh, organising the event in, in the first place. Also to the speakers, Michael, Hugh, Mark, Manu, uh, and, and, and uh, Paul. Um, I won't try and summarise everything because I think uh, uh, David's done an excellent job as we as we go through. Uh, just to say, I've been working in Malaysia for probably 20 years, and, the and the, I realised at a very early stage, the first three things that people wanted to talk about in Malaysia were education, the English Premier League, and property. And actually, little has changed in the last in the last uh, 20 years. As Michael said, um, yeah, there's 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 a there's a constant interest in in uh, in uh, development in in uh, Malaysia. And the last time I checked, they're not making any more land, uh, and therefore over time, uh, that investment has always shown shown an upward trend. There's been there's been there's been peaks and troughs, but uh, not many troughs and and and, uh, and more peaks. Uh, interested to hear that uh, uh, Michael's been through uh, four recessions. I might be slightly older than Michael. I can remember a few more, uh, although I can't remember the Great Depression. Uh, I'm pleased to say, although some may think otherwise, uh, but certainly I'd, I, I would echo all, all of his thoughts in terms of in terms of uh, the strength of that market uh, over uh, over time and uh, the fact that uh, um, you, you, you ought to have, you ought to, have, ought to be able to see capital growth over a, over a uh, sustained period. Um, Hugh's update uh, on the UK market, I think, was was uh, spot on, particularly uh, isolating the 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 uh, the benefits of a low exchange rate and the um, I'm sure the government weren't, weren't playing that when they saw the pound fall but obviously it's a huge advantage to uh, to uh, overseas investments uh, also highlighting the growth in the um, uh, logistics space and, and uh, commercial property and obviously the uh, difficulties in, in uh, retail um, going on to, to, to Mark's piece I just had to realize the scale of of, of, um, of uh, uh, Fallacy, particularly the uh, chimney lift, which I thought was really impressive for the roof garden. But as, as David said, I think the, ex the, the expansion of the uh, Northern Line is key. Um, it's all about location, isn't it? And uh, actually be able to get, get, get to places quickly. Apple's involvement there is it's hugely important. So uh, a really great up up update on that um, process. Um, tax was really, really well covered by, by uh, Manu and, uh, and, and uh, Paul. And actually knowing enough about tax to be dangerous, um, I think that's summarised all, all the main points. On the structuring, uh, just to echo Michael's point, I think I think the BVI advice on structuring is 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 old advice. Uh, the biggest single important part of uh, tax going forward is substance, and very difficult to uh, form a sort of substance in the uh, 
in the BVIs. So I think, I think uh, keeping it simple in terms of structuring is important. And also just to echo Paul's point, it's a very comp complex area and don't do anything without um, taking advice or paying for the advice. Um, so overall, thank you all for, for, for organizing. Thank you for, for, for speaking. I learned a lot from it. Uh, and for, and uh, as they say, it's all about location, location, location. And I think in terms of the UK and in terms of uh, Malaysia, places really where, the, where the, the, the investors understand the market, understand property, and overall, hopefully, there'll be long-term gains in, in the, both jurisdictions. So thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that, Robin. Uh, very, very comprehensive. And I like your three bits about Malaysia. But obviously, being involved in rugby football, there should be a fourth one, which is rugby, and I'm sure Malaysia will, will get that moving as well. Um, <laughs> I'd now like to invite our, our illustrious chairman, Mason Lai, OBDL, to address us. Chairman. Thank you very much uh, to all the panel speakers and everyone involved. So um, what is coming up next? We've got some exciting events. We have two business events next month, one on renewables and renewable energy UK and Malaysia. And the other one uh, is on capital markets, including listing on the uh, London Stock Exchange. And then we have other events coming up and you can look up our website to, uh, to get the details. Um, how about thinking of uh, joining BMS? We are the number one organization for people who want to uh, do business in Malaysia and for Malaysians who want to do business in the UK. It's very easy to sign up. Just go to our website. It would take less than five minutes. Uh, and we look forward to sort of hearing from you. And thank you all very much uh, again uh, for all your contribution and to attendees for supporting and attending this event. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Certainly do have a look at the website if you are interested in joining. Uh, as the Chairman says, it only takes five minutes. And then, of course, you will have the opportunity to buy the tie. There we go. That's where I started. That's where I end. Thank you ever so much for joining us, Malaysia, here in the UK. Thank you to everybody. Um, be safe. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.